Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala English Paper 1, Module 2. I am Dr. Jaydeep Sharangi, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. This module is prepared by Professor Debomitra Kaur, Women's College, Kolkata. In this module, we are going to learn elegiac poetry during Anglo-Saxon period or Old English period. The key areas which we will trust or thrust as important for important areas to work with, there will be an introduction to the age followed by features of Anglo-Saxon lyrical poetry with special reference to Widsith and Dior's Lament. Introduction to Elegiac Poetry, Instances of Elegiac Poetry, The Seafarer, The Wanderer, The Wife's Lament, The Husband's Message, The Ruin and Wolf and Edward Kerr. So, at the end we shall like our previous chapter or module we shall sum up with certain references. Let us begin. Anglo-Saxon age is marked by the settlement of the Angles, Saxons and Jutes in Britain. The literature was completely anonymous. That means, no signed record is available with this literature. So, the anonymity is a part of Anglo-Saxon literary canon or specially to Anglo-Saxon elegiac poetry. By elegiac poetry we mean the poems which recur on, on a basis that deal with elegiac subjects that means that brood over the past, brood over for civilization, brood over from the destruction of a city or it is a personal lament or a lament for the damage or death of someone. Elegy is a literary genre in which a person mourns or a poet mourns for the loss of someone, loss of a civilization, destruction of a city or town or the damage of a society. The Anglo-Saxon age is a really a reservoir which is a rich reservoir of Anglo-Saxon elegiac poems. In this chapter, we are going to conceptualize the origin, development and growth of Anglo-Saxon elegiac poetry and we will be referring to some of the important Anglo-Saxon elegiac poem poems and we will be examining how Anglo-Saxon elegiac poetry forms an important part of corpus during Anglo-Saxon literary period or during the age of old English literature. The contents of the chapter are the features of Anglo-Saxon lyrical poetry with special reference to Widsith and Dior's Lament. Let us first talk about or conceptualize what are Anglo-Saxon lyrical poems and how are they represented and what are their important features. As we have already mentioned, Anglo-Saxon literature is marked by anonymity. That means, no one knows who has written it because as we have already emphasized the fact that Anglo-Saxon literature was oral. So, the transmission was oral. Therefore, we do not know the what was the text and how it has been preserved. So, most of the elegiac poems that we will be dealing with today are anonymous. So, we cannot record or register name of the poet or the author. Number 2, the elegiac poems are sad poems, morose poems that deal with certain loss of a person or separation and the talk about the destruction of a city. 
that means like elegies across literature anglo saxon elegies are also more mourned are mourning poems they are uh, they are the poems that talk about something is lost and they talk about the vacuity of the heart and the heart bleeds for separation anglo saxon poetry are the compositions or the or the poems were cheap source of entertainment for the anglo saxon readership so when you read anglo saxon text the cheap interest falls on anglo saxon elegiac poetry poetry was essentially oral as we have already mentioned but at the same times it was pagan by pagan origin or heathen origin we say it is more closely associated with literature non religious that means most of the these texts are written before the advent of christianity but later on with the advent of christianity christian affairs and matters were infused into pagan corpus so they looked little different over a period of time as the things went on the surviving literature is contained in four major manuscripts one is exeter book the second one is versilia book versilia or versilia book the third one is junius manuscript and the fourth one is cotton vitellius manuscript a and 15 so these are the four manuscripts where unsigned poems are visible recorded and come and present in front of us so the anglo saxon elegiac poems handed down orally transmitted orally but most of the poems are lyrical some run into more than 500 lines and some are short lyrics but they are passionate and very compassionate poems and they reflect the mood of serenity and tranquility of these poets and these poems also reflect how these poets or anonymous poets were close to nature and man and nature are very important in these poems now let us talk about the features of old english language i think it demands our special emphasis or special attention the language was based on consonant sounds and this particular statement needs clarification the most important aspect of old english literature is the language the language was dominated by the consonant sounds like ha sh that means s and c st s and t t str s t r s t r r h and r th t h r t h r and so on they form the vital part of the syllables the accent is mostly put on the first syllable of the word which is quite unlikely in modern grammar in modern pronunciation the accent may be on the first syllable second syllable third syllable or so on but in on anglo saxon age the most of the accents are on the first syllable it is a kind of habit that led to many changes in the language as the vowel sound is comparatively insignificant the rhythm of the lime is determined by the consonant sound that means the consonant sound played an important role in determination and demarcation of linguistic output uh, both phonetically and linguistically at the time of pronunciation the normal poetical line is made of a number of syllables divided into two sections each of which contains 
two rhythmic accents. There are so many other factors that we can talk about in relation with Anglo-Saxon language. For example, the alliteration. Alliteration is an important linguistic device by which one particular consonant sound is repeated again and again. Another important facet of Old English language is the use of caesura. Caesura is the pause between the two hulbs of one particular line. Usually, it divides the line into two segments. The meter is usually composed by the variation of stresses and the unstressed syllables. So, the stressed syllables and unstressed syllables are beautifully balanced. The lines are predominantly trochaic and dactylic by which we can come to an understanding that it begins with an accented syllable then it is followed by unaccented which is a big contrast to modern day speech habits. The language was inflectional. The old English literature is marked by a particular habit of using inflectional suffixes and prefixes and infixes in the language. By inflectional we mean there is a provision to inflation of the particular word to certain degree by the attachment of uh, affixation. The Anglo-Saxon poetry employed stylistic devices like variation, composite words and canings. If we look into the corpus of Anglo-Saxon elegiac poetry, many words are composite words, because composite words are also words that, that describes um, that describe a particular event or object beautifully. And the variations like caning and composite words that actually add beauty to Anglo-Saxon poetry discuss two important Anglo-Saxon lyrical poems, number one, Widsith and number two, Dior's Lament. Both the po poems record the autobiographical narratives of two scops or minstrels. There is a similarity to two, both these particular poems, because both of them recorded by minstrels or two scops who comes from one place to another place and these poems are autobiographical. By autobiographical we mean there are person, personal touch to these poems. The 144 line long Widsith is divided into three thulas that means three parts which catalogues the lists of names of the kings, tribes and legendary figures whom the narrator has visited. So, it is an important record of the narrator who has visited certain places and he is recording that in that particular poem. It is a fantastic travelogue for it names both historical and legendary figures ranging for 200 years. So, this book is a beautiful panoramic book that talks about the voyages or the traveling heroes encounter with people at different parts of Scandinavia. And uh, he records the historical names as well as legendary figures in this particular poem. At the same time, it includes a large number of tribes, their settlement, their history, their modes, their nuances in respect to literature and social position, political upbringing. So, these two poems almost record the history of the people and they have an anthropological base to it. By anthropological base to it, I mean that this these historical records are rooted in socio-cultural nuances. Now, let us talk about the nature of the elegies. As a battle-torn race, the Anglo-Saxons were always 
perturbed by the concept of transience. As we have already understood and we have learned in our module 1 that the Anglo-Saxon period was the period of different attacks, the attacks by the Vikings, the internal conflicts, there were several battle, battles. So, the life was not permanent at all. So, life was consist, considered as a piece of transience, it is a part of fleeting habits of time, man is a part of tempus fusit, man comes and goes. So, most of these poems celebrate the concept of transience of life. They believe that death should be countered by everlasting fame which every man should earn in his lifetime that is their philosophy or that is the philosophy of a pagan or heathen what you earn in life what that is the greatest strength in you and you should fight with death in order to make your name permanent or write permanently with your abilities and with your performances. Later with the advent of Christianity the concept of trans, transience changed considerably. In the, in, the let, in the middle period of the Anglo-Saxon age, we come to know that the birth of advent of Christianity took over England. So, there is a broad, change, broad sea change that brought a different dimension altogether in England. So, what was mainly a kind of a uh, doubtful life, uncertain life, Christianity gave them hope and tolerance. So, with the advent of Christianity, the concept of transience changed considerably and it looked as a different life view as well. Human life was seen as a loan from God, that was a unique customary among the people of the Anglo Saxon age. They thought that human life is a taking loan from God, as God is all, God is all powerful, nature is all powerful and it is temporary home. It is a temporary home means the body I have is a temporary body, it is the loan body from my God, while heaven is the permanent abode where we can go and we can create heaven by our efforts. So, this was the concept we had during that time. The theme of exile, suffering, separation, which were expressed in the elegies, were uh, deemed to be suitable by the uh, by the people. That means exile was there. People used to go out for earnings. People used to suffer for separation. Separation, husband from wife, friend from frame, master from servant, are all painted in these particular poems. Thus, the elegies were written down by people who could write, who at times incorporated their own lines to understand or underscore the Christian sentiments and otherwise pagan verses. So, if we can categorize them, there was two streamlining pagan and, and Christian, but at the same time one intermingling or one fusing to another. Thus, the elegies present a curious blend of pagan imagery and Christian ideology. Pagan is rich with imagery that means images related to pagan life, heathen life. At the same time, the Christianity was a motto of life. Therefore, there is a preponderance, deliberate infusion of Christian sentiments into that. And the elegies were found and preserved in Exeter book manuscript. Now, let us talk about another very important elegiac poem, The Seafarer. The Seafarer is possibly the most beautiful lyric we come across during the old English period or Anglo Saxon age. The 124 line long poem presents the suffering of the speaker who is away from the comforts of the mead of all and the love of his Lord. He goes out and therefore, he goes on a sea voyage and his separation is been transformed into beautiful lyrical uh, poem, family, friends and he is forced to travel on sea 
in an uh, inhospitable climate and during those days we all are aware of the fact that sea voyages were dangerous that it was marked by uncertainty so and he went out in an inhospitable climate so all is been recorded as part of the narration in the poem yet he believes that he must undertake this journey for suffering in this world would bring him eternal bliss he is very particular in his uh, deliberation he knows that if he can undertake this journey and his suffering in the world that will bring eternal bliss and that will take him to heavenly abode that we have just mentioned uh, and a kind of ultimate for people there. The poem has inspired many critical debates. It is a battleground of critics because critics over the ages have different views, different interpretations. They have the autonomy of interpretations over a period of times. Some say it is a contrast between the old world view and the modern world view. Some say it is a two sets, one is a pagan world view, one is a Christian world view. Some critics have interpreted it as a Christian poem because it talks about Christian consolation, Christian hope. So, it is a kind of poem which has been in, uh, infused with Christian sentiments where sea is a symbol of the tumultuous earthly life, sea is the life where we bleed and the life ahead eternal bliss that the poem is talking about possibly the life of hope as hope is an important thing that uh, Christianity cherishes. And the ship is the Christian charge that guides man to heavenly abode and the ship, ship which has been referred to the poem again and again is possibly the vehicle through which one can take his body or mind to the heavenly abode. So, it is a link between earth and heaven. Some scholars would prefer to link the theme of exile and suffering of the Celtic poetic tradition. That means, some people think it is a kind of crisscross between the Celtic traditions and the, and the onswing or ongoing Christian, Christian mission and uh, some are very antagonistic to accept the fact that the poem is out and out a Christian discourse. Hello friends, now let us switch over to another very important uh, poem written during this time, The Wonder, which has been often been uh, told as a companion poem to uh, the previous poem that we have already explained, The Seafarer. The poem consists of uh, 115 lines and it uh, relates to the dramatic monologue of a person who actually looks into world from his own perspective. He emphasizes on the loneliness of the solitary man who is now the uh, kind of lordless. By lordless we mean there is a separation between the lord and uh, the servant and who is lordless now he is speaking about his own sadness for his lordlessness. Uh, he thinks himself as unprotected, unsafe. He at the same time he is suffering from discomfort and his discomfort is accentuated in, an, in a lamentation, in a form of lamentation. The poem also ends with a, uh, with a uh, homiletic tone, by homiletic we mean a kind of message, a tone of message that says it is a greater understanding of life. Now, let us sum up what we have learnt from this module. We have read variety of mo a variety of poems or specifically elegiac poems of a the Anglo-Saxon age. We have followed their sentiments, we have also examined the characteristics or features of Anglo-Saxon poetry. We have also traced back some of the important poems and the most important facet of this unit is speaking or explaining about the Anglo-Saxon language, which is predominantly a consonant based language. 
which marks a strong departure from the modern day English. So, as a whole the po this particular unit is all about Anglo Saxon elegiac poetry, poetry written by women narrators and male narrators. I hope all of you have enjoyed this particular module and you will be debated and you will it will give you insight into new critical doctrines to look at or debate with Anglo Saxon literature. Now, no module should go without any reference. Those who are interested can read F. S. Halton, Old English Sea Imagery and Interpretation of the Seafarer that is published in the Yearbook of English Studies 1982. The second one A. D. Horger, The Structure of the Seafarer, The Review of English Studies Volume 30 and the most important book in this connection, Eli Gordon, Traditional Themes in the Wanderer and the Seafarer, the Review of English Studies New Series Volume 5, Number 17, January 15, sorry, January 1954. I hope with all these texts available, you should try to read the poems in translations. I hope you enjoyed this module very much. Thank you.